Thank you, Daniel. Thanks to all the organizers for giving me a chance to present the talk that no young person would ever present because it could be, mean the end of his or her career. But since my career is already finished, I can present it. I think it's, it concerns an important topic. And so even if not everything may be clear, I think it's good to at least worry about it for, for an hour or a little more than an hour. All right, so here are the three heroes of quantum mechanics. And unfortunately, they are, of course, all dead. And the following two colleagues are dead too. This is Warren Jones, who was really a very wonderful mathematician and a great friend. And he passed away in September of last year. And this is Detlef Dürr who passed away at the beginning of January. He was a victim of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it's really very sad to, uh, that these two colleagues have disappeared. I thought I should mention that at the beginning of my talk. Now here's a little uh, short list of contents. I will briefly explain what the lecture is about. Then I want to recall the ETH approach to quantum mechanics in the non-relativistic setting. It, it, there is also a relativistic ETH, but I won't have time for that. Then I want to show in terms of examples that the basic hypotheses underlying the ETH approach can be verified in concrete models. It will turn out they have something to do with Huygens principle. And then uh, to conclude this talk, I will discuss uh, very simple models that arise in a limit where this, from, from relativistic models when the speed of light tends to infinity. In fact, this will be in some sense the main part of the main portion of this talk. Of course, I've benefited from many discussions and collaboration with various people on the topics that I'm going to discuss now. So here is a sort of an abstract. My purpose in this lecture is to extend the standard formalism of quantum mechanics in such a way that the theory actually makes sense. You know, the more and more people believe that quantum mechanics doesn't make sense, which of course is, is an illusion. It makes perfect sense, but you have to know what you mean when you talk about quantum mechanics. The extension that I'm, that I'm going to discuss uh, is called the ETH approach to quantum mechanics. E stands for events, T for trees, and H for histories. And I hope you will, you will understand the meaning of the title by the end of this lecture. This approach supplies the last one of four pillars quantum mechanics rests upon. Erhard Seiler told me I should already have introduced three pillars because a plane is uh, defined by three points, but not by four points. But th there are four pillars, I cannot change it. The first one is to say that physical quantities characteristic of a physical system are represented by self-adjoint operators. This is always true. It's also true about classical physics. The second pillar is that the time evolution of these operators is governed by the Heisenberg equations of motion. The third pillar is to introduce a meaningful notion of states so that we can calculate expectation values and to introduce a notion of potential and actual events into the theory. And then once these three pillars are there, the fourth pillar concerns a general law that governs the time evolution of states in quantum mechanics. People tend to be quick to say, we know what that law is. It's the Schrodinger equation. That, of course, is as wrong as it can be. It's uh, unfortunately a bit more complicated. The core of this talk will really be about uh, models illustrating the general assumptions underlying the ETH approach. And these models arise from relativistic models of an atom coupled to the electromagnetic field in a limit where the speed of light tends to infinity. 
this limit just simplifies the discussion and I think it's pleasant to have models that are as simple as possible and yet illustrate the main ideas of the approach. My general goal in this work, which has already extended over several years, is to attempt to remove some of the enormous confusion befuddling many people who claim to work on the foundations of quantum mechanics. In fact, it seems that during recent years, the confusion has increased every year by quite an amount and it's time to get rid of these confusions. So topics to be addressed in this particular uh, lecture. Uh, well, of course I should talk about the role of time in quantum mechanics. There are many people who discuss the meaning of quantum mechanics but forget to introduce time and, to, and they forget to introduce the evolution of operators or states of uh, physical systems. And then of course, you cannot really understand what quantum mechanics is about. I will however focus today on introducing sharp notions of what an isolated physical system is in quantum mechanics. I will then discuss what states are of physical systems. This is related to Gleason's theorem. And then I will introduce notions of potential and actual events, to some extent following ideas that uh, the late Rudolf Haag always propagated. I will explain why the Schrodinger equation is inadequate in describing the time evolution of states in quantum mechanics and I will replace it by a statistical law for the time evolution of states, which will be in accordance with the prob probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. I should, of course, also talk about projective measurements and indirect or weak measurements, but uh, today I won't have time to say much about this. And uh, of course, it would also be good to present the relativistic version of the ETH approach, but again, this will not be possible in a one hour talk. So the main purpose, as I already men uh, mentioned, is the discussion of simple models that illustrate the general ideas. So here is a little slide about direct and indirect measurements. But uh, since I won't really discuss that, let's uh, just skip it. This is the arrow schremont experiment and the, 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 the black icon is, is a you know, particle tracks in a detector. So here is an important figure. This figure immediately shows that relativistic theories are never fully predictive because you only know about events that happened in your past light cone. And so you don't have complete access to initial conditions. And you might actually be surprised that all of a sudden something happens that is totally unexpected. So the past light cone is full of events or facts. The future light cone is filled with potentialities. And this dichotomy is one that we should incorporate into a good formulation of quantum mechanics. And that's what the ETH approach will do. All right. Uh, since I claim that the Schrodinger equation is inadequate in describing the time evolution of states in quantum mechanics, I should of course discuss various Gedanken experiments, but this has been done by many people over many years, it was already clear to the founding fathers that the Schrodinger equation doesn't really describe uh, the evolution of states in quantum mechanics, at least whenever a measurement or observation happens, they said it, it will be interrupted. But unfortunately, it's never an exact equation of evolution of states. Various people have made Gedanken experiments to illustrate this point. One of the famous one is the, the, is the one that Wigner introduced. Wigner and his friend, 
who will come to a disagreement because Wigner wants to apply the Schrödinger equation to everything while the friend wants to you know, claim that he has seen the outcome of measurements. This has been popularized in recent times, for example, in a nice uh, Gedanken experiment by, by Hardy. And the Frau Rieger Renner uh, Gedanken experiment stirred quite a lot of uh, you know, confusion. Uh, I think I should not get into that. Uh, my collaborators and I also made a Gedanken experiment quite some years ago, which could even really be implemented in a real experiment. And it shows very clearly that the Schrödinger equation is not adequate to describe the evolution of states. All right, so let's now try to summarize the ETH approach in the setting of non-relativistic physics. The purpose of this approach is uh, manifold. I want to clarify the notion of what the state is, assuming that the state has some kind of ontological meaning. Then I want to explain what potential and actual events are that can be featured by isolated open physical systems. Some people believe that for a system to be isolated and open is contradictory, but that's in fact not the case. As soon as you have massless modes, a system can be isolated and nevertheless release stuff to the outside world. Uh, and then I will conclude by deriving the quantum mechanical law for the stochastic evolution of states of isolated physical systems. So S is always the name for my physical system. Physical quantities that characterize a, a system are represented by certain abstract bounded self-adjoint operators, X hat, these operators belong to a list O sub S of operators. Uh, o sub S has the property that if X hat is an element of O sub S and F is a real value of bounded continuous function, then F of X hat also belongs to O sub S. Apart from that, there are no additional assumptions about structure of O sub S. Now, time is a fundamental quantity in physics. In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, it is described by the real line and it parameterizes evolution in, in the system. At every time t, there is a representation of O sub S, of this list of physical quantities by concrete self-adjoint operators acting on a separable Hilbert space H sub S. So X hat maps to an operator X of T that belongs to the bounded operators acting on H sub S at every time T. All right. Um, people who have you know, worked on many body theory or on quantum field theory or thing, uh, quantum theory of systems with many degrees of freedom know that these operators X of T can be localized, usually not at the very sharp time, but they can be localized in a certain interval I of the time axis. So if, if you examine concrete examples, they motivate the assumption that every operator X that represents a physical quantity X hat in this list O sub S of physical quantities is localized in a compact interval, which I will denote by I sub X of the time axis. And of course, I of a function of X is the same as I sub X. Now in the Heisenberg picture, the time evolution of operators X of T representing physical quantities of an isolated system S is described by unitary conjugation with the propagator of the system, as we all have learned in school. If the system is autonomous, the propagator is generated by a self-adjoint Hamiltonian. 
And you can say that the, the operator, the concrete operator that represents x hat, the time t prime is conjugated to the concrete operator x representing x hat at time t by the propagator of the system, as you see in equation one on this slide. So let i be an arbitrary interval of future times. In other words, i belongs to the half axis t naught to infinity, where t naught is the time of the present. Then we define e sub i to be an algebra generated by arbitrary finite sums of arbitrary finite products of operators x. x represents some physical quantity x hat from the list also best with i sub x equals i. In other words, x should be localized in time within the interval i. I think that's pretty clear. Then we define an algebra E greater or equal to T to be the one, the, the one that is generated by all the algebras E sub I with I contained in the inter half open interval T to infinity. And then you may want to close it. In fact, it's pleasant to work with von Neumann algebras because in a von Neumann algebra, the spectral projections of an element are, also belong to the algebra which can be a very useful property. E, e is the algebra generated by all the E greater or equal to T. All right. Now from these definitions, it is totally clear that the algebra E sub I contains or is equal to E sub I prime whenever I contains I prime. And therefore, E greater or equal to T contains or is equal to E greater or equal to T prime whenever T prime is larger than T. Now, of course, most people in the audience will say, well, these algebras are all the same. They're all probably equal to the algebra of all bounded operators on the Hilbert space. It will turn out that this is not the case in in important examples that model the physics of what you, for example, see in an experiment. So you should not jump to any conclusions about how these algebras are nested inside one another. So here is a definition. Suppose S is an isolated physical system. What does it mean for a system to be isolated? It means that for all practical purposes, you can do as if the system S did not interact with any degrees of freedom in its complement. That's what an isolated physical system is. It does not mean that the state of S might not be entangled with the state of the complement, but there should be no interactions. Now potential, why do I look at isolated physical systems? That is because the evolution of operators representing physical quantities is given by the Heisenberg equations only if the system is isolated. If the system interacts with its environment, time evolution becomes a mess in quantum physics. It's, in this respect, classical physics is much simpler. So now we know what isolated systems are and why we focus on isolated systems. Well, then potential future events in, in such a system or potentialities that might set in at the time t in the future are described by partitions of unity, pi sub xi, xi belongs to some uh, countable set, capital X, and these uh, projection operators, pi sub xi, should all belong to the algebra E greater or equal to T, where T is a time in the future. The sum of these projections, sum of xi in x, pi sub xi should be the identity. That's a partition of unity in terms of orthogonal projections. All right, and specifically if these if this partition of unity 
describes a potential future event, then all these projections should belong to the algebra E greater or equal to T with T at a future time. An isolated system can now be defined in terms of a co-filtration of algebra Z greater or equal to T where T is time. That's in fact a, you know, the good definition of what we mean by isolated systems. Uh, where these algebras E greater or equal to T are related to one another by, by using the Heisenberg equation of motion. So here is a very fundamental principle that enables one to actually make sense of quantum mechanics and make sense of measurements in quantum mechanics and of facts and so on. I call it the principle of diminishing potentialities, abbreviated as PDP. It is the statement that the algebra E greater or equal to T of all, the algebra of all potential events that might happen at time T or later, this algebra contains, but is unequal to the algebra E greater or equal to T prime whenever the time t prime is strictly larger than the time t. In other words, this means, as already Aristotle was anticipating, that potentialities pass away in the future. The more you look into the future, the, the fewer than the, the, the algebra generated by future potential events is. This principle of diminishing potentialities characterizes what should be called isolated open systems. You see, for a, you can define a closed system to be one where all these algebras E greater or equal to T are the same. In other words, that they are independent of T. But in an open system, they depend on time T. I will show, and this is in some sense, uh, you know, one, uh, main, one of the main purposes of this lecture, that this principle of diminishing potentialities holds in simple models that uh, are, you know, typical models to describe experiments and observations. Now, a state in quotation mark, a state that doesn't really have an ontological meaning, is usually simply defined to be a density matrix, capital omega acting on the Hilbert space of the system. And then you define expectation values of operators, of bounded operators to, give, to be given by the trace of omega dot A. That of course is a conventional. But now we have to try to extract from this notion, a notion of state that does have a good physical meaning. So suppose a little omega is a state in the, in the sense of the previous uh, transparency here at the bottom, then omega sub t is the restriction of omega to the algebra E greater or equal to t. That, you know, that is the state on potentialities at time t or later. Now this is a you know this is a, an important uh, thing because people always like to discuss quantum mechanics by focusing on pure states. So we might imagine that little omega is a pure state on the algebra E of all possible potentialities that might happen in the course of history. However, since E greater or equal to T is contained in E and not equal to E, omega T will usually be a mixed state. That is a consequence of what Schrödinger called entanglement. So these states omega T on the algebras E greater or equal to T tend to be mixed states and that's a consequence of this principle of diminishing potentialities. This observation really opens the door for us towards a natural notion of actual events or actualities. 
I don't understand, and I will explain that uh, in just a few seconds. But before I would like to add a remark, Gleason's theorem in a form that was generalized by the Japanese says that states omega sub t on these algebras e greater or equal to t, which I, which I want to be for Neumann algebras, are in one one correspondence with quantum probability measures, mu sub t on the lattice of orthogonal projections in these algebras. And I think these quantum probability measures really do have a good physical meaning. So it's a pleasant thing that Gleason theorem doesn't only hold on the algebra of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space, it, ho it holds on, on very general for Neumann algebras. So that's just a, a remark about states. Now, I want to explain what actual events are. So in accordance with the Copenhagen, I want to preserve as many of the good features of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Some people might argue, I simply should keep the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and not worry. The problem is that the Copenhagen interpretation is a sort of messy thing. It's a heuristics and it lacks internal coherence. So I have to do better than Copenhagen, but I want to keep its attractive features. So according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, it would appear to be natural to say that the potential future event even by one of these partitions of unity in terms of orthogonal projections belonging to one of these algebras e greater or equal to t, where t is a future time, that such a potential uh, future event actually happens in the interval of times above t. In other words, that it becomes an actual event setting in at time t if and only if the state omega sub t as a state on the algebra e greater or equal to t looks like an incoherent superposition of states that belong to the ranges of these projections pi sub psi that form the partition of unity. So in this equation five, the right hand side doesn't show any off diagonal elements so it describes an incoherent superposition of states. Now I would like to render the meaning of this equation a little more precise. Let M be some algebra and let omega be a state on the algebra. In other words, a positive normalized linear functional on the algebra M. We define the centralizer of a state little omega on the algebra M to be generate the algebra generated by all operators X that generate one parameter subgroups that leave the state omega invariant. That's a sort of a good definition in words or if you like a formula, the centralizer C sub omega of M is generated by all operators X in M such that omega applied to the commutator of A with X vanishes for all A in M. I forgot to write for all A in M. So the centralizers of an algebra are subalgebras of M and the centralizer of the state omega is actually has the feature that the state omega is a normalized trace on C omega of M. That enables us to completely classify centralizers. The center of the centralizer, which, is, which I denote by Z sum omega of M, is defined to be, to consist of all operators in the centralizer, which commute with all other operators in the centralizer. This notion of the center of the centralizer finally enables us to introduce a 
perfect general notion of actual events. So let this be an isolated physical system in equation six, we set m equal to the, one of these algebras e greater or equal to t, and we pick for omega the state, omega sub t, the state of the system at time t. Here is a definition of what actual events are. And I hope you will understand it and uh, try to memorize it for the rest of the talk. An actual given a state omega t of the system s at time t, an actual event setting in at time t uh, is described by the center z sub omega t of the centralizer of the state omega t on e greater or equal to t. And we speak of an actual event if this uh, center of the centralizer contains at least two non-zero orthogonal projections, pi one and pi two, which are disjoint, meaning that their product vanishes, and which both have a non-vanishing born probability. In other words, the expectation of these projections in the state omega t should be strictly positive. That's what we mean when we say that an actual event sets in at the time t. People might say it's easier to just say that omega t is a mixed state on the algebra e greater or equal to t. The problem is that in relevant physical examples, all normal states on these algebras e greater or equal to t are mixed. So the notion, the conventional notion of mixed states is inadequate in uh, defining what actual events are. But this definition too is totally adequate. All right. So let us suppose for simplicity that uh, the center z sub omega t of e greater or equal to t of the centralizer of omega t is generated by a family of orthogonal projections, pi sub xi, the xi belongs to a discrete set x sub omega of t, which I assume to be countable. Then equation five holds true. You know, this equation that omega t looks like an incoherent superposition of states in the ranges of these projections pi sub xi. This equation is a direct consequence of the fact that my pi xi is here belong to the center of the centralizer. Now, I claim that once we understand that this is a good notion of actual events, we can de derive from this notion a law that describes the time of the stochastic time evolution of states in quantum mechanics. And this law comes from what I like to call a collapse postulate, or let's call it axiom CP. Let's suppose that an actual event described by a partition of unity of orthogonal projections pi sub xi that uh, you know, generate the center of the centralizer of the state omega t, that such an actual event sets in at some time t. Then the state omega t must be replaced by one of the states omega sub t and xi, which is the state omega t but restricted to the range of the projection pi sub xi. For some xi in x, that, uh, such that the projection pi sub xi has a positive bond probability. So in other words, we already know that the state omega t is an incoherent superposition of states in the ranges of these projections pi sub xi. And now the, the collapse postulate says that in such a case, nature chooses one of the states omega sub t xi as the state with which we should make predictions of future events. <clears throat> 
the probability that nature chooses the state omega sub t xi as the state of the system after time t is given by the bomb by by the bomb rule namely the probability of xi is simply the expectation of the projection pi sub xi in the state omega sub t so that's the collapse postulate which you know sort of looks reminds you of something you learned in school uh, when the teacher discussed the Copenhagen uh, interpretation but there it is completely ad hoc here it becomes natural thanks to the principle of diminishing potentialities which tells us that uh, you know these uh, center sets of omega t might generically be non-trivial in the Copenhagen that uh, no, no, nothing like that was was around. All right, that's the collapse postulate. So this is basically the end of my discussion of the ETH approach. Uh, and let me conclude with a metaphoric picture. This is a tree uh, not, not far from where I live. Uh, you see that this tree has uh, points where the different branches join, they, they, they correspond to events, and the, the green, the, all the possible tree-like paths on this tree uh, are, are the tree, and H is a specific uh, path of, uh, that passes through a specific sequence of events that is called a history. So now you understand why the approach that I'm describing is called ETH approach. Some people might think that the ETH approach is basically just something like Everett uh, with a little bit of decoherence mumbo jumbo added in. But in fact, it's really much better than, in fact, Everett doesn't really make sense in my opinion. And uh, the usual decoherence mumbo jumbo, unfortunately, cannot be used to understand uh, the time evolution of states of isolated systems. All right, so that's the end of the general discussion. Now I would like to. Uh, oh, this was. Now I want to explain why this principle of diminishing potentialities actually holds true in certain typical simple systems that can be used to describe experiments. I claim that massless modes, photons or gravitons, play a crucial role in physics, in, in particular in, in the description of experiments in quantum mechanics. And let's see why that is. So let's suppose S is an isolated physical system that might consist, for example, of a static atom that is uh, nailed down at the origin in space and it is coupled to the electromagnetic field. The atom has certain internal excited states, internal energy levels. Let's suppose it has m internal energy levels, then the Hilbert space of the atom can be taken to be a C super m. We can imagine that m is finite in order to eliminate all technicalities. The Hilbert space of the electromagnetic field is the Fox space of the photons that uh, everybody has learned from Jan Dyrzinski's book. Uh, the electromagnetic field can be described by a field tensor F sub mu nu of tau and x. Tau is time, x is space. With the property that for real value test functions, h mu nu and space time, the operator F sub h which is the field tensor smeared out with these test functions, h mu nu, uh, actually defines a self-adjoint operator on Fox space. And these operators, these are field operators satisfy the usual locality axiom of quantum field theory. So that's certainly a fact and can be verified as long as we consider the free non-interacting electromagnetic field. 
I denote the Hamiltonian of the free electromagnetic field by H naught. It's a positive operator on Fox space. All right. What's the Hilbert space of the system? The Hilbert space of the total system is then the tensor product of the Fox space of the photons and the Hilbert space H sub A of the atom. Let's introduce the, the notion of space-time diamonds. The space-time diamond is a, is a set in space-time associated with an interval t, t prime on the time axis. And this is simply the intersection of the forward Lycon over the space-time point t0 with the backward Lycon over the space-time, under the space-time point t prime zero where t prime, where the time t prime is larger than t. I will show you a picture of these diamonds in just a few seconds. The bounded functions of the field operator, these are uh, operators f, sub a, f of h, where the test functions have their support in such a space-time diamond, these bounded functions generate a certain algebra a sub i, i is the time interval from t to t prime. This is because, you know, the, the operators f of h are self-adjoint, so you can look at, for example, uh, uh, bounded functions of these uh, field operators. They generate an algebra, you can take the weak closure, and that's what I mean by the algebra a sub i. Here are a few algebras that, I'm sorry about all these algebras, but I think, you see, quantum mechanics is about the algebra and not about Hilbert spaces. Hilbert space doesn't have any interesting structure, but algebras in, in particular, filtrations of algebras have a very interesting structure. And that's why I need to introduce these algebras. D sub i, is the algebra A sub I tensored with the identity on the Hilbert space H sub A of the atom. E sub I is A sub I tensored with all the possible bounded operators acting on the Hilbert space of the atom. And E greater or equal to T for the non-interacting theory is the algebra that you obtain by taking all the algebras E sub I super zero where i is an interval of time contained in the half open interval from t to infinity. And then you close weakly to get the von Neumann algebra. Now it turns out that as long as the atom doesn't interact with the electromagnetic field, the principle of diminishing potentialities holds, in fact, that's the statement of the next equation. If you look at the commuting algebra, E greater or equal to T prime commutant, this consists of all operators commuting with all the operators in the algebra E greater or equal to T prime. And you intersect this with the algebra E greater or equal to T, you get precisely the algebra D sub I associated with this uh, space-time diamond. This is an D sub i is an infinite dimensional algebra, no matter how short the interval i is. So the principle of diminishing potentialities holds in a very, very strong form in, in this model, as long as there are no interactions. How do you understand that the equation nine is correct? Well, it turns out that if you look at two field operators, f mu nu at the space-time point x and f sub rho sigma, there shouldn't have been a comma between rho and sigma, evaluated at the space-time point y, then the commutator of these two uh, operators vanishes unless x, the direction from x to y is light-like. This is what uh, Detlef Buchholz would call Heuchen's principle in 
quantum electrodynamics. So if you use this uh, form of Huygens principle, you can easily deduce from it uh, this uh, principle of diminishing potentialities in the form of equation nine. Now, in order to not to have to worry about any complicated technicalities, I will now discretize time. I just look at times t sub n given by integers n. By c, I denote the speed of light. So I now want to introduce interactions between the atom and the quantized electromagnetic field. And, uh, and here it is. Uh, I pick a unitary operator in the algebra E sub zero one. You see E sub zero one consists of all field operators that are located in this lowest uh, space time diamond that sits between time t0 and time t1, okay? So I take an operator that belongs to this uh, algebra generated by field operators in the space-time diamond, tensored with arbitrary bounded operators on the atomic Hilbert space. I define gamma to be the free propagator of the electromagnetic field, e to the minus i h zero times u. That's a unitary operator. And then I define u sub k to be the operator u transported with the free photon the dynamics to a later uh, space-time diamond. u of n is simply the product from one to n of the operators u sub k. Now you verify and very easily, it's a one line computation that gamma to the power n is e to the minus i n h naught times the operator u of n. Gamma of n conjugate is simply gamma of minus n, that's unitarity. And this is true no matter what n is, n can be anything, zero, one, two, et cetera. These notions are illustrated in the figure that you see on the bottom of this slide. You have these uh, space-time diamonds here and then a future light cone and past light cones. And you can see photons that are produced in one of these space-time diamonds, for example, the one sitting above time T2, will never penetrate into the future red future light cone because they travel, they, they leave the system at the speed of light, they stay within the green light cones. You can, have, you can ask, and that's important for what will follow next, what happens to these space-time diamonds when the speed of light tends to infinity? Well, then, of course, these uh, light cones open up and the space-time diamonds become time slices, as you see in the right half of the figure. All right. Now, I claim, and this is very easy to verify, that the interacting model also satisfies the principle of diminishing potentialities. This is because uh, the algebras E greater or equal to N of the interacting system arise from the algebras I had before for the non-interacting system simply by conjugating with unitary operators. So it's very easy to verify that the principle of diminishing potentialities is valid for the interacting model, uh, at least as long as we uh, go along with the discretization of time. You can also verify that the algebra E greater or equal to N prime, where N prime is a time larger than N, is obtained by applying the propagator gamma to the power M minus N prime 
to e greater or equal to n and then multiplying by gamma to the power n prime minus n. So in other words, all these algebras are conjugated to one another. You should not me, you should not be misled to believing that because of this unitary conjugation, these algebras are all equal to one another. That's definitely not correct. So let's prepare a system in an initial state, omega naught at time n equals zero. We would like to understand how this state evolves stochastically if we use the rules of the ETH approach for time evolution, namely the definition of actual events and the collapse postulate. An interesting choice of an initial state is the following state, omega sub naught, which is obtained by taking the Fock vacuum for the photons and I tensor it with a density matrix on the atomic Hilbert space. All right, so um, this state does not yet entangle the atom with the electromagnetic field. However, if I use the interacting time evolution to see how the state moves into the future, then the interactions will entangle uh, the atom with the photons. The problem that we encounter in this particular model is that the stochastic time evolution of states of the system that I have defined here exhibits memory effects. That is because photons in different space time diamonds know about each other in the sense that the state, the Fock vacuum doesn't factorize over operators that belong, that are localized in different space-time diamonds. So there are memory effects that makes the explicit control of the time evolution in this model somewhat subtle and uh, certainly for a talk like that it's not a good idea to look at this particular model but to simplify matters a little bit by now taking the limit where the speed of light tends to infinity. As I already mentioned, in the limit where the speed of light tends to infinity, the space-time diamonds approach time slices, slices where time is uh, contained between k and k plus one. The algebras, these uh, algebras of the electromagnetic field uh, confined to a space-time diamond then approach uh, algebras that you can view to be algebras of all bounded operators on Hilbert spaces H sub K that are associated with the time slices. And in order to be as simple as possible, I imagine that these Hilbert spaces H sub K are finite dimensional complex Hilbert spaces. So the dimension capital N is supposed to be finite in what follows. So I now look at the previous model in the limit where the speed of light tends to infinity. infinity. This is an exercise that we just finished in a little paper with Alessandro Pizzo. So in this limit where C tends to infinity, the electromagnetic field approaches something that I like to call the R field for radiation field. Um, I will only follow the evolution of states of the system S for positive times. Let us pick an orthonormal basis phi sub j, j goes from zero to n minus one in these uh, Hilbert spaces of the time slices of the R field in the time slices. All right, S sub finite is the set of sequences K underlined that have the property that Kn equals zero. Uh, Kn is any uh, integer between zero and n minus one, but Kn 
equal zero except for min finitely many possible values of times n. For k underlined belonging to S finite, we define a tensor product state phi sub k underlined. It's simply the infinite tensor product of the states phi sub kn. Phi sub zero is the state where all the indices kn are equal to zero. And it's called the vacuum. It's the analog of the Fock vacuum that we considered before. It is sometimes called a reference vector in an infinite tensor product Hilbert space. The Hilbert space F sub zero of the radiation field is then given by the closure of the space of finite linear combinations of vectors phi sub k, where k belongs to S finite in the, in the norm determined by the obvious scalar product. We set, we choose for the Hilbert space of the system, the tensor product of F sub zero, that's the analog of the Fox space, tensored with the atomic Hilbert space H sub A. We now define a shift sigma, the shift, a shifted sequence sigma uh, applied to a, a sequence k underlined at the position n is simply k sub n plus one. This shift enables us to introduce a unitary operator script S, which when applied to phi sub k simply is phi applied to the shifted sequence sigma of k. This is a, this map is obviously unitary and so it can be extended to, to the entire space F sub zero by linearity. It leaves the vacuum that vector phi sub zero invariant. The time one propagator of the atom before it is coupled to the radiation field is given by some unitary, unitary operator V on the atomic Hilbert space. And I said gamma naught to be script S tensored with V. I now, use in, I now introduce interactions between the atom and the radiation field. For this purpose, I pick a unitary operator U on the Hilbert space C super N, that's a uh, the, the Hilbert space of the radiation field in one time slice, tensored with the atomic Hilbert space. And then I define U1 to be U restricted to the Hilbert space H0, UK to be the transport of U1 to, the, to time K using the free propagator, gamma naught, which I have defined already. And then U of N is U sub N times U sub N minus one, et cetera, times U one. N is an arbitrary time. The interacting propagator of the model is then given by gamma to the power N. The gamma is simply gamma naught times U one. It follows easily that gamma to the power N is given by gamma naught to the power N times this operator U of N for all times n. All right. Here are, now I have to unfortunately again bother you with a few algebras. E, the algebra of all interesting uh, physical quantities characterizing the system is the algebra of finite sums of operators of the form F tensor C. F is a bounded operator on this uh, pseudo Fox space F sub zero and C is a bounded operator on the atomic Hilbert space. Then you can close this algebra in the say operator norm. E greater or equal to N is what you obtain by choosing an X in E and transporting it then to time N. And although these are unitary operators, these gammas, turns out that these algebras E greater or equal to N become smaller and smaller, the larger M becomes. So in fact, the principle of diminishing potentialities is again true in this model, just like in the previous more relativistic model. 
I choose as an initial state uh, a density matrix on the atomic Hilbert space and tensor it with this with the state phi sub k uh, on the on the radiation field. I assume k is a is, belongs to this set as finite of sequences that look like kn equals zero except for finitely many times n. And then x is an operator of the form f tensor c, which belongs to the algebra E. So our aim is to determine the time evolution of omega naught according to the, to the law of the ETH approach. Using induction in time, we find that the state omega sub n on the algebra E greater equal to n has the following form. Omega n applied to the operator gamma to the power minus n x gamma to the power n where x belongs to E is, and x is, is one of these tensor products, F tensor C, it has the following form. Uh, you take the expectation of the operator F in the state phi applied to the shifted sequence, sigma to the power n applied to K underline, and you compute the expectation of C of the operator C in inner density matrix omega sub n that acts on the atomic Hilbert space. The, we will see that the induction hypothesis says that omega n is proportional to an orthogonal projection on the space H sub a. These uh, matri density matrices omega sub n are sample paths of a certain stochastic branching process that I will now describe. So you see this stochastic branching process is supposed to generate sample paths starting from omega naught. So omega naught gets mapped to a state omega one, gets mapped to a state omega two, etc. Eventually gets mapped to a state omega n at time n. Omega naught I choose to be the initial condition that they specified here. All right, now it turns out that the stochastic branching process in this particular model is, de is described in terms of a quantum Markov chain. And that's you know, what simplifies the analysis. In the previous model where the speed of light was still finite, we don't get, a we get the stochastic branching process, but it is not Markovian. In the limit where the time, uh, the speed of light tends to infinity, it becomes Markovian. So it's really just a quantum Markov chain. This Markov chain acts on the density matrices of the atom and the operators that just the completely positive maps that uh, map uh, density matrices of the atom to new density of matrices of the atom. These are completely positive maps depend on the sequence K underlined that uh, goes into the definition of the initial condition. It's the, it's the sequence that labels the state phi sub K. All right. Now the sample, the sample paths, the density matrices on the, on the atomic Hilbert space are obtained by unraveling the Markov chain. And now I have to define what this Markov chain looks like, and uh, I have to tell you what it means to unravel it. But here is already a sketch of what's going on. You start with an initial state, omega naught, there is a certain completely positive map that maps it to a new state, and then applying the definition of actual events and the collapse postulate it turns out that the state at time one could branch into several branches. Nature chooses one of these branches with a probability governed by Born's rule. You apply a new completely positive map. You get again a mixture at time two. Nature chooses one of the states in this mixture to go into the future, etc. cetera. 
So that's a sort of pictorial representation of what's going to happen. Now, in order to, you see, I'm already running over time, but I warned Daniel that I will need a little more than an hour. And, uh, and since uh, Benjamin gave a very long speech at the beginning, I, I feel I can still go on for about five, five or 10 minutes. So in order to reach the end, let's look at a very simple example. I choose as an operator, you describing the interactions between the atom and the radiation field an operator U of the form sum M from one to capital M. Remember capital M was the dimension of the atomic Hilbert space. T super M, T super M is a unitary operator on a time slice Hilbert space of the radiation field tensored with the projection Q sub M onto a basis element Psi sub M in, of a basis in the atomic Hilbert space. This is a, obviously a unitary operator on the tensor product space. And it will describe, it couples the atomic degrees of freedom to the radiation field. We would like to follow the stochastic evolution of the initial state omega naught according to the ETH approach for a propagator that is uh, defined by, you know, as before, that is defined, oops like it was here in this equation 17. All right. So I claim the state omega sub n at time n restricted to the to operators belonging to the algebra e greater or equal to n as the following form. That's an induction hypothesis. Well, all operators in E greater or equal to N are sums of operators of the form gamma to the minus N, F tends to C, gamma to the power N, where F is a bounded operator of the radiation field and C is a bounded operator of the atom. If I apply my state at time N to operators of this form, it turns out it's given by the expectation of F in the state phi apply to the sequence k, but shifted by n steps times multiplied with the trace of a density matrix omega n uh, multiplied by the operator c. Omega n, and that's part of the induction hypothesis, is proportional to an orthogonal projection on the atomic Hilbert space. I now want to explain the induction step, how to prove I n plus one, assuming I n is true. Obviously I one, I zero is true because that's by the definition of our initial condition omega sub zero. So we first consider a, a state omega n satisfying equation 20, the induction hypothesis to the algebra E greater or equal to N plus one, which after all sits inside the algebra E greater or equal to N. So I can do it. So I apply omega N to an operator of the form F tensor C propagated to time N plus one. Well, if you do the computation, you obtain, this is given by the expectation of the operator F in the state phi uh, uh, applied to the sequence k shifted by m plus one time steps multiplied with the trace of a certain density matrix omega hat sub m plus one uh, multiplied by c. Well, omega hat, hat sub m plus one arises from omega n by applying a certain completely positive map, which we describe next. Turns out omega hat sub m plus one is given by the sum L and M from one to capital M G super ML of N V, V, remember V was the propagator of the atom before it is coupled to the radiation field V QL omega N QM V star. 
So V is unitary on the atomic Hilbert space. GML of N is the scalar product of the operator T super M applied to phi sub KN with the state T super L applied to phi K sub N. Looks a little like a metric. Turns out the map from omega N to omega hat N plus one is completely positive. So that, of course, immediately implies that omega hat sub n plus one is again a density matrix. It, I mean, it's easy to check that the trace of omega hat plus n plus one is uh, equal to one. It's the same as the trace of omega n. So you can apply the spectral theorem. Omega hat sub n plus one can be decomposed into a sum of projections pi sub j of n plus one multiplied by eigenvalues. All these eigenvalues are positive because omega hat sub n plus one is a density matrix and I order them in such a way that P1 is the largest one and PL, L is smaller equal to M is the smallest one. All the further eigenvalues are equal to zero. So pi sub, j, pi sub j of n plus one, these are orthogonal projections. And since the trace of omega hat sub n plus one equals one, the sum from one to capital L of P sub j of n plus one times the trace of the projection pi sub j of n plus one equals to one. Now we apply the collapse postulate axiom CP which tells us that nature will choose, you see the state on the radiation field that we found previously. This state is still pure. It cannot be decomposed, but this, the density matrix omega hat plus n plus one, sub n plus one is not pure anymore. So we decompose it into these, uh, by, by using the spectral theorem and then the collapse postulate tells us that nature chooses one of these uh, one of these projections to go into the future. That, in fact, that's easy to check that if you apply the definition of actual events and the collapse postulate, you find out that omega sub n plus one must be proportional to one of these spectral projections pi sub j of n plus one of the density matrix omega hat sub n plus one. Which one? Well, that's governed by Born's rule. The probability for choosing a specific j star is given by Born's rule. Now, if you plug this back into the state that we had here, you find out that uh, this uh, sorry that this proves uh, this proves the i sub n plus one. So the induction step is complete. Now let's look at the weak coupling regime. The weak coupling regime is where the operators that tell us how many photons are generated by the atom in a time step, where these operators are very close to the identity. Epsilon is much smaller than one. Then these uh, coefficients that we had before. Mm, no, it doesn't seem. These coefficients, G super ML of N, these coefficients are all very close to the identity up to small corrections of order epsilon. That means that omega hat sub M plus one is very close to the conjugation of omega sub n by the unitary operator v up to a small error term of order epsilon. So in fact, omega hat sub n plus one looks like v omega n v star with a with very big probability of order one minus order epsilon. That means that the time evolution of states looks as the one that would be predicted by the Schrodinger equation 
up to small errors, very tiny errors. However, for purely entropic reasons, it happens every once in a while, namely with the frequencies proportional, proportional to epsilon that at this, in the step from type n, uh, from time n to time, time n plus one, not v omega n v star is chosen, but the state that is in fact orthogonal to v omega n v star. This is then perceived as an event. So this happens for purely entropic reasons. In other words, although over long stretches of time, the Schrödinger equation is a good approximation to the evolution of the atom. Every once in a while, there is a little catastrophe and the state jumps to one that is very unexpected and has a small a priori probability of being chosen. All right, what's the strong coupling regime? Well, the strong coupling regime is a regime where the atom is very strongly coupled to the radiation field, meaning that these coefficients G M L of N are close to the identity matrix. In that case, the density matrix omega hat sub N at time N plus one is given in terms of the density matrix omega at time N by applying the projections QM from both sides and then conjugating with the free evolution of the atom and then summing of all little m's from one to capital M. And that is correct up to error terms of order epsilon. So that means that, uh, you know, with high probability, omega sub m plus one, the state nature chooses according to the collapse postulate is given in terms of omega n simply by conjugating one of these projections qk with the free evolution of the atom up to an error epsilon. So suppose that omega n is of the form that's sort of the new induction hypothesis. Suppose omega n is of the form VQL V star for some index L somewhere between little one and capital, between one and the capital M. Then the probability to choose omega n plus one of the form VQK V star is given, this probability is given by the trace of Q, K, V, Q, L, absolute value squared. This follows immediately by applying the collapse postulate. What does it mean? It means that the evolution of states in the, cup, in the strong coupling regime, where these matrices G, M, L are close to the identity, this evolution is well approximated by the sample paths of a classical Markov chain, this transition function given by P of K and L. Now, of course, we can check what happens when we mix weak and strong coupling. We can imagine that, uh, you know, the, the, the matrix GML of N has to form all ones between one and capital K and then zeros between K plus one and M. And so on downstairs also ones from one to cap capital K and then zeros from K plus one to, to M. And then, so this, this uh, upper left matrix just consists of identities. This upper right just of zeros, the lower right, left of zeros and the lower right is simply the identity matrix. Then up here we have weak coupling and down here we have strong coupling. And now if, if the unitary V that describes the free evolution of the atom does not respect this decomposition of the atomic Hilbert space that corresponds to these blocks, then of course weak and strong coupling uh, get mixed up with each other and this leads to a very, very wonderful, simple model of what the measurement or an observation means. So I hope this was clear.
maybe it was a little brief, but it's time to stop. So here is a summary. The ETH approach to quantum mechanics provides a logically coherent theory of potential events and of actual events and of the recordings of such events in measurements. It has some resemblances with the many worlds interpretation of Everett, but in fact, and also with the girardi rimini weber collapse theory. However, it doesn't have, to, it doesn't really extend quantum mechanics. It doesn't, uh, uh, there is no, you know, violation of, of the basic features of quantum mechanics. It supersedes these somewhat strange formalisms with a clear formalism that uh, they can go along with just one world. We don't need many worlds. The models in section four that I discuss, discussed, I think provide a fairly useful illustration of the ETH approach. I hope it was clear what they said. Of course, you can ask questions. As in the genesis of special relativity, fields describing massless modes, photons, and gravitons appear to play a fundamental role in quantum mechanics because it's thanks to the existence of massless modes that we can derive the principle of diminishing potentialities. So I think this is a, you know, a sort of important in, insight. If, if, you, if the world consisted just of massive modes, we would never solve the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. The fact that certain, that the world becomes classical, looks classical, has something to do with the existence of light and of gravity. All right. Uh, well, I think that's it. You know, it, I uh, applied all these ideas to, to, uh, trying to speculate about what gravity means and also to the information and unitarity paradox that has bothered people in the high energy community for decades and which in fact uh, are paradoxes that uh, simply dissolve in, in view of the ETH approach. In any event, it's time to stop. I thank you for your attention. And of course I take questions. Many thanks indeed, Jörg. Yes, are there questions? If there are no questions, it means that nobody understood anything. That would... uh, no, I have some questions. Erhard Seiler. Oh, okay. He hello, Erhard. Hi, Jörg. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is um, you said you gave a criterion when an event sets in. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't quite clear to me if that means that it's a sharp point in time or that it has a certain extension in time, no, you see, like Rudolf Haag would have liked it. The only thing that is sharp is we can say that we can determine a time at which the event sets in, but an event is described by projections. These projection operators, uh, every one of these projection operators is localized along the time axis in a certain interval. These intervals are usually not point-like, but they have an extension. So in other words, an event doesn't happen at the precise time. It sets in at the precise time, time, at the precise time, but then it lasts for a little while. Okay, my second question, I could ask more, but okay. <laughs> A second question uh, is a very primitive one. I mean, since the Huygens principle plays such a fundamental role in your well, treatment, uh, does that mean that in two plus one space-time dimensions we couldn't make sense of quantum mechanics? Well, you can you can write down quantum mechanics, but you cannot describe measurements. <laughs> so it wouldn't make sense. Well, that's, uh, I, I would agree with you, yes, but maybe that's debatable. We are lucky, we live in three plus one. I think so. This, is a, this provides an understanding of why the Lord chose three plus one dimensions to make us. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I also have a question. I, I should, however, add, I mean, the Huygens principle, you know, is one reason why the principle of diminishing potentialities holds in certain models, but perhaps there are other reasons, for example, Johannes Walcher might find a string theory explanation of the principle of diminishing potentialities that uh, does not involve Huygens principle. Yes. Uh, can I also ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, has this anything to do with this Gelman Hartle uh, description of quantum mechanics in terms of histories? No, it only has the, the word history in common. You see, the, the Gelman Hartle, which is incidentally, I think, basically the same as Griffiths, Bob Griffiths. I think that's a big misunderstanding. It doesn't explain anything. This formalism of Griffiths and of Gelman Hartle attempts to make quantum mechanics almost empty because the dynamics, say the Heisenberg picture dynamics and the choice of an initial state do not determine in their formalism whether events will happen and when they will happen. They have to put in the, the events by hand. And then in order to say that if you don't observe an event, it is as if nothing had happened, they have to introduce this notion of consistency. And then they argue that the consistency of their histories is a consequence of uh, decoherence. But I think it's really not a good story. It's one that uh, will disappear once people understand the ETH approach. Okay, thank you. I also have a question, if I may. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. Um, hi, Jörg. Um, Hello, Jeff. I, um, it's sort of a, it's a naive question. So it seems that your definition of an event setting in is a deterministic statement. The time at which an event sets in is determined by the evolution up to that. No, 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 no not at all. By this, no, no. Uh, that's, no that's how does the stochastic time come in? Yeah, so that's a misunderstanding. You see, okay. the question of whether a potential event, the potentiality becomes actual, depends on the state. Yeah, okay. And no, the, I'm talking the about the time at which. And the, the trajectory of states you run through is a stochastic object. Yeah, this I th this I understood. I, I I didn't phrase my question well. I'm talking about the time at which an event sets in. Oh well. That, that, and my you know naively like if I put an excited oh. atom somewhere, the time at which it collapses to the ground state is a random time, with some prediction uh, for the distribution, right? Absolutely, and that's what comes out when you when you look at this model in more detail. You see, it turns out in this model events happen, happen at all times, but usually the event is essentially not noticeable because the uh, state you choose when you go from time n to m plus one is basically the one you would guess by using Schrodinger evolution. It's very close to that one. Then of course you don't notice, you feel everything is the way you expect it, but then every once in a while, the state changes very radically, collapses to a sort of unlikely state. And that's what you perceive as an event. And the times when such collapses happen are random variables. Yeah, okay. okay sorry, can I ask a question too? Yes, sure. Okay. Honest? Mm, so this, this, sorry, hi. Uh, so this distinction between potential and actual events, I mean, is this, is an approximate distinction or is it exact? And- No, no, that's the, the these are two different notions. So you but, see, but, that's because you didn't read Aristotle, otherwise you would know. So what are potential events? Potential, <laughs> event, potential events are arbitrary partition potential events that might happen at the future time t are arbitrary partitions of unity in terms of orthogonal projections 
that belong to these algebras E greater or equal to T. This is a purely algebraic notion that is totally independent of how I choose my initial condition. But an actual event is a potential event that becomes actual. And whether it be a potential event becomes actual or not depends on the state of the system at the time where the actual event sets in. Maybe I'm, what I'm trying to ask, I think, or I was trying is how exact you need the photon to be massless. And that's one. And, and another one, well, which maybe I add on to this, because you say that you also mentioned gravitons and you mentioned high energy physicists. And yes. they somehow believe that gravity is quite different from photons, especially when it comes to things like, uh, well, information paradox and things like this. So I was wondering if you see any difference between photons and gravitons so, as well in the role they play for this entire discussion. So you see in my in the entire discussion, the massless modes had only one purpose. They were providing examples of systems for which you can prove this principle of diminishing potentialities. And this principle is a consequence of locality in the sense of quantum field theory, local commutativity for massless fields. And that's all I have used. Okay, is all I have used. And you see, Huygens principle is just an example of how you might go about verifying this principle of diminishing potentialities. But perhaps there are other mechanisms that also lead to the principle of diminishing potentialities. I actually don't think so. I think in relativistic quantum theory, it's very important to have massless modes to be able to derive this principle. But uh, I have not used any details of the dynamics of photons or gravitons. I do, however, believe that the unitarity or information paradox is a big misunderstanding. You see, it's, it's totally wrong to be, I mean, the notion of a pure state doesn't mean anything because when I look at all possible potential events that might happen in the future of a space time point, I get an algebra, which is what is called a type three for Neumann algebra. Such algebras do not admit any pure states anyway. So, I mean, you know, this old fashioned notion of pure and mixed states that we inherit from, no, from the non relativistic quantum theory of systems with finitely many degrees of freedom has simply misled people like Hawking and so on to make this fuss about the unitarity in the information paradox. That's my view on this. You may not agree with me, but uh, that's my view. I could say more about it, but then we would still be here at six o'clock, which is too late. Maybe you have a comment on my comment. No, it, it, it helped a bit. I, I, no, no, it helped a bit. Thank you. There is a, I, I should maybe since you already asked this kind of question, you see, there is a, a strange thing if you go if you do quantum theory on curved space times then generically Huygens principle doesn't hold but you see to talk about curved space time of the future is is probably wrong we should these uh, the potentialities of the future have something to do with potentialities that don't see curvature yet and that's why Huygens principle can be used. Maybe this is a little cryptic. And I'm not totally finished yet, Tani. Thank you. Other further questions or comments? Uh, I, I actually like to ask a question just to check if I understood some of your underlying ideas. All right. Hello, Annalisa. Uh, Hi, <laughs> okay, well, 
Um, uh, well, is it correct to say that in this ATH approach, so the collapse, which is, means that actual events are happen, is a spontaneous process. It's not does not depend on an observer. And performing a measurement, what we usually say we perform a measurement in a lab, is that means that we are in a situation where this uh, spontaneous uh, actual event happens quite surely with the hyperbolic. Yes. Is that so, correct? Yes. So you see this uh, collapse postulate simply says that if you have, if your state looks like an incoherent superposition, mm. states in the ranges of these projections that describe an event, then nature chooses one of these states in the superposition to go on into the future. This is, you know, like Brownian motion or like a random walk on a, on a lattice. If, if, if I'm a random walker and I have reached a certain site on a lattice, then nature pushes me into one of the directions uh, of the possible directions to go on with a certain probability that is given by a transition function. So in this sense, the collapse postulate is just a, a rule for how to choose how to go on into the future. All right. Okay. Now, what, what about measurements? Well, you know, people are clever. They can construct isolated systems or systems which for all practical purposes look like isolated systems that produce certain desirable events that they can interpret as successful measurements. I have thought about this and in my papers, you find more about what measurements mean, but I didn't have time to explain this in detail. But I think you have understood it correctly. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Jakob has some questions because he looks at me. Do you have any question, Jakob? No. Oh, the question. So, 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 ah, yes. So, question. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Jörg. No, uh, no. I, I oh. have, uh, I have heard you talk about this on several occasions, and also read your papers. And think this was a particularly clear presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I'm always worried that people don't really understand what I mean to tell them, but perhaps I hope I make progress. In spite of my high age. Uh, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, Jan Dereszynski. Uh, yeah, yeah, I recommend in, 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 uh, in your uh, um, formalism, uh, an important role is played by a certain algebra, von Neumann algebra. Yes. Uh, uh, which uh, are actually a family of von Neumann algebras. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, how do you question. choose? How do what? you choose this? Uh, so, oh. so, for instance, the the events uh, uh, depend on on this uh, the choice of this algebra. Yes, but you see, uh, because the the centralized. Yes. So we have to go back to the beginning of the talk if you yeah. want how to know the answer. Should I do that briefly? You see, I showed a certain wonderful drawing at the beginning of the talk. Oh, now I went back a little too far. This is the drawing. Can you see it? You see, yes. suppose I apply this, say, in a relativistic context, then I have to trade time for space time points. And then it's clear that the potentialities, the potential future events, are operators that are localized in the future, like cone above the space time point at which I am. That's a very natural thing to say, right? And yeah, the, yes, but but so this depends on on your on you on the, your position in the in space time. Absolutely. Now, uh, so so for, uh, I'm I'm in a different place. So for me, nature would I mean for me the reality will be different. No, or, no, not uh, at all. 
But you see, you are now asking me to explain the ETH approach in the relativistic setting. And this is too much since you will, I mean, you are in Warsaw, you are already at the late time and you are probably looking forward to having your beer. And if I start to discuss the relativistic ETH approach, you will still be here in an hour from now. That's too much. I can tell you privately if you like. Okay, yes. The, in, so this, you should look at this drawing and you should also look at another drawing which I showed. Um, no, I just went by. You see in the, in the non in the limit where C tends to infinity, these light cones open up and then the position in space becomes irrelevant. It's only the time that is left. And then the future is the same for everybody. It's simply times after the present time. And that's what I was discussing today. And then it's clear that the algebra that describes future potentialities consists of all operators that are localized along the time axis above a certain time. Is that clear? Jan. I think he fell asleep. No? No. No, is it clear or? But, uh, well, uh, I. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Jan is still thinking about it. Are there further questions? Hello. May I ask a question? Yes. Ah, yes, I'm your Tanimoto. Uh, in the beginning, you talked about the situation where there's a spin and one person is measuring that and then another person is measuring the whole uh, laboratory. And um, can you comment on this situation, how it looks like in your- what do you mean? You mean Vigno, Vigno's friend? Ah, yes, yes, that's yes. right. Yes, so I can comment on that if you like. You see, what, what is Vigno? Vigno was indoctrinated the belief that the Schrödinger equation describes the evolution of states. Okay. Provided you look at an isolated system. It is always clear that if a system interacts with its environment, then you know all hell breaks loose in quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, certainly the evolution is then not described by a Schrödinger equation. And it's also usually not described by a Lindblad equation. Lindblad would just be an approximation. And it, it can become extremely, extraordinarily complicated. So that's why people look at isolated systems. That's why when you describe an experiment, you should include the machinery by which you collect your data in the description of your system because this machinery interacts strongly with the little subsystem that you want to explore. And everybody together is then an isolated system. In this drawing, it's this brown box, the apparatus, which looks a little like an old radio, and then the, the little subsystem, which is a particle with spin that, that you want to measure. And then maybe also the, the, the lady who does the experiment, she's a friend of Wigner. So this is an isolated system. And then Wigner learned in school that isolated systems have states that evolve according to the Schrödinger equation. And then he, he evolves this whole system according to Schrödinger. But the friend at some time has the impression that she made a measurement that the spin was either up or down. She might not be sure whether it was up or down. That's not so important. If she wasn't sure, she will henceforth make predictions of the future using a mixture, namely a mi an incoherent superposition of the state of the total system where the spin is up and the state of the total system where the spin is down. And if you now predict future experiments on the basis of that mixture, you get different predictions from Wigner's prediction who, he, who uses unitary evolution. 
And this became very, uh, the, the, the contradiction becomes very quantitative in this paper by Frau Rieger and Renner. Frau Rieger and Renner then concluded from that that there is a basic contradiction in quantum mechanics. My conclusion is very different. It is simply not true that for open isolated systems, states evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. And that's because this principle of poten diminishing potentialities is at work, which enables us to replace Schrodinger evolu evolution by a stochastic evolution. And then all these contradictions disappear. In fact, Wigner would then not use the Schrodinger equation to evolve the system, but he would use the ETH formalism. Was that clear? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Apparently not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to think about that. <laughs> yes, you can, uh, you can send me your question in more detail and I will try to answer it by mail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further questions? <laughs>